James was quite possibly the first epistle uh, written of the New Testament. And we may have thought, you know, that because it comes after Hebrews, um, it, it's sort of to the latter end. Well, actually, it, it sort of puts a, a different perspective on things when we realise how early. And it explains some of the issues that needed addressing when we realised that it was right up the front end of the New Testament, not that long after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we, we reckon, as we said the other day, between mid to late 40s, James was probably written. We can't, it's difficult to pin it down to a particular year, and we don't have to, but just get the idea. And indeed, a lot of the issues that James raises in his books, we can map across to the early chapters of Acts, and we will be doing some of this uh, throughout the week. Now, when we come to James, uh, brothers and sisters, we might think as, as we read it in our readings during the year that it's sort of moving from here to there and, and a bit disjointed in some ways. Well, the, the more we, we get involved with James' arguments uh, and um, the, the issues that he addresses, we find that the linkages are there, but they're just not in James. Uh, because what James does is pull upon the resources, the pools of other scriptures to make those linkages for him. Uh, and there's some very clear pools, as we're going to see again through this week, that he draws on. One is Deuteronomy. So we'll see him dipping into Deuteronomy under inspiration. Another is the book of Proverbs, and he's going to use that as a resource again. And the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, so particularly those, and also more intriguingly, as again we'll discover, that there are certain chapters that seem to recur in the message of James. And it was absolutely fascinating for me, brothers and sisters, um, when I was looking at James and, you know, you look at a word or pick up a phrase and, and you follow it through and look at it in a concordance and you find yourself suddenly back in Hebrews 12 again and again. And that's the wonder of the scriptures to me. And it, it just reinforces, brothers and sisters, and it has done to me, that we're dealing with, and I know I don't need to tell you this, but we are dealing with an inspired word, a God-given word. It is God's wisdom from above. A number of people have asked me, who do I think James was? And yes, I believe the James we're dealing with is the Lord's brother. Just turn with me briefly to Galatians. And you see, Galatians was probably the first letter that Paul wrote in the New Testament. And it's this very letter that records um, that uh, <coughs> verse 19 of chapter 1 of Galatians, but other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. That's where the phrase comes from. And you notice in chapter 2 of Galatians, James was one of the pillars, we believe, of the Jerusalem Ecclesia. Um, verse 9, please, of chapter 2, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. So it's James that give the right hand of fellowship to Paul at the beginning of his ministry. Now, we're not going to go into the Lutheran debates, brothers and sisters. We haven't got time to this week. Suffice it to say, we will see enough evidence in the scriptures between James and the writings of Paul that they were not at variance at all. You know, Luther's conclusion was that James was an epistle of straw. That's what he wrote. That's not right. And we'll see that as we progress through our studies. So it's the James of the Jerusalem account, uh, Council. Don't turn there at the moment, Acts 15. We may have opportunity to turn there later. It's the James that received Paul again in Acts chapter 21, when Paul had been round the Gentile ecclesias, brought in the collection of the poor fund and brought it and handed it to James in Jerusalem, for the poor saints in Jerusalem, because they were being persecuted, James 1. So we can see that the contact, actually, between James and Paul was quite regular 
and we will see common th things uh, uh, appearing. And I believe that we have evidence um, that Paul probably quoted from James as well. So, I'd like you to come to Colossians, please. I, I'm, I'm using Colossians just to paint, uh, as, as we focus on wisdom now, uh, the sort of backdrop of the Greek and the Jewish influence as it was, and the warning that Paul gives us initially, and will allow the scriptures to move us into James. So just come to Colossians chapter 2, and this is a warning for you and for me, my dear brothers and sisters. So, verse 6 please, Colossians 2, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That's the exhortation. Rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding then with thanksgiving. And so we should. Now, verse 8, here's the warning. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, lover of wisdom. That's what the word means. Don't let people spoil you through being lovers of wisdom of this world and vain deceit. And the word deceit means delusion. People are deluded into the philosophies, into the wisdom of this world. After the tradition, there it says, you see, of men. There's the wisdom of men, the traditions of men. And we're going to see this cropping up again in James. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So we're, we're having a clear comparison made here by Paul in this instance between the things of God, the wisdom of God, and the wisdom of the world. The word spoiled, brothers and sisters, in verse 8 literally means to carry off, to be carried away, to be led captive. And do you know what? That's exactly what the wisdom of this world does to us and to our minds, doesn't it? You know, things can seem rational. They can seem feasible. Well, yeah, I suppose you're right. And we can be carried off by the wisdom of this world, by the philosophers. We'll think a little bit about this later. Of this world. And we can find ourselves going at a tangent to the things of Christ to the wisdom of God. We need to be careful, brothers and sisters. Things are presented to us in our world very subtly by very well-educated people. But nevertheless, it's the wisdom, the philosophy of this world. Now, interestingly, just turn over or look, look to the later uh, in chapter 2, if you will. You see, verse 20 Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, that's the same word we just read earlier on, rudiments, why as though living in the world are ye subject to these ordinances? And that means dogmas. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are to all perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. So we need to understand the difference between the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. The doctrines of men, the doctrines of God. And James will help us do that. And, and this is uh, a fascinating point in verse 23. Which things, these doctrines of men um, and such like, indeed have a show of wisdom. A show of wisdom. They're not really wise. They have a show of wisdom in will worship. Now, if you look at the root of that word will worship, it's the same word as religion in James chapter 1. It comes from exactly the same Greek word, will worship and religion. It's this, this exterior show of things, and we'll be talking about that in a later study. Uh, and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honour, to the satisfying of the flesh. So, so Paul is dealing with this issue. And, and just look where he goes now in chapter 3. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. 
And that's exactly where James takes us. So it's about time we went to James. Let, let's go to James then. <laughs> Chapter 3, please. James 3. And here, James, with, with this as a backdrop, with all these Greek philosophers, brothers and sisters, with the Jewish traditions, the doctrines of men, James in this newly founded and large ecclesia in Jerusalem, he certainly had his work cut out. You know, there were the rich, the poor, the well-educated, the not so well-educated, uh, and he had to drive through this wisdom of God and help them understand. So, verse 13 of, of chapter 3, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? Okay, so there's the question, who is the wise man then? Who is going to be wise in the things of God amidst all this philosophy out there? Let him, look, show. Wisdom is a thing that's shown, brothers and sisters. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. A lovely phrase. Now you can have knowledge without wisdom. You can have an encyclopedic knowledge, brothers and sisters, and still have no wisdom. But you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. So knowledge is essential to understand God's way, but it is as essential to build on that. There have been tragedies, brothers and sisters, down the, the years of people who have been highly acquainted, highly knowledgeable in the scriptures, but lacked the wisdom to apply it. And James encourages us not to fall into that trap. Yes, we do need the knowledge, and that's why we do our readings and come to Bible schools. But we have to build on that. And it has to be shown in our lives. So wisdom is all about the application of that knowledge. And... Um, just come with me again to that verse 13. Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. That word conversation is, is the same one that Brother Kitson picked up in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 15. How we ought to behave in the house of God. That's the same word. I'd like you to turn back with me to Hebrews 13, please. Comes up here again. We show in our way of life our wisdom, brothers and sisters, in the decisions we make, in our attitudes one with another. Hebrews 13, um, verse 5, let your conversation, same word, be without covetousness. Be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Now verse 7, I would like to suggest at least that perhaps one of the principal characters that Paul has in mind here as he writes this epistle is James. It's largely to the same audience, the Hebrews, the Jews. Look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their behaviour, their conversation, that wisdom that was manifest. And I believe in his mind, he had James. Remember James, who ruled over you. Remember how wise he was. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. So there we have a, 
an understanding of James's character. Now, just again, come back to James chapter 3, please. We had that lovely phrase, didn't we, at the end of verse 13, with meekness of wisdom. Wisdom is not something that we can be proud about. Knowledge, I suppose it's perhaps easy to, to um, become proud and puffed up. Can't really do that with wisdom. It's an issue of meekness, is it not? Um, just come back to Matthew chapter 5. And meekness is one of those qualities <coughs> that we need if we want to be in the kingdom, isn't it? Verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So that's on one side, the meekness of wisdom, this attitude. That sort of attitude will help us towards the kingdom, brothers and sisters. Now that is contrasted in James with the wisdom from beneath, which is all about strife. Now come to Galatians chapter 5. And just join me in this rather unpleasant list. And we just see in verse 20 of Galatians 5 that strife is one of those things that will prevent us from entering the kingdom. Verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, and uh, verse 21, envyings, and, and look at the end of verse 21. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So back in James 3, please. Verse 13. His works with meekness of wisdom. That is a characteristic of those who would want to inherit the kingdom. The next verse, verse 14. If you have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom, this wisdom of so-called wisdom of strife and envying, cometh not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. So we're having two wisdoms contrasted here by James for us. But let's strike a positive note now and let's move on to verse 17. Here we have the seven pillars, if you will, of wisdom. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then pure. Peaceable, And those two are brought together again, or rather prior to this, in the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. The pure and then peaceable. Gentle, easy to be entreated. You see, this is the evidence of the knowledge that we have translated into wisdom now. Full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now, the way that the Greek reads here, brothers and sisters, in verse 17, is when it says the first pure, that's the overriding, if you will, the overarching principle. It's not as if we get an ever-decreasing list of importance. It's pure, first pure. That's, that's the banner statement of wisdom from above is first pure. And it comes from the word holy, from the root word in the Greek, holiness, to be holy, to be separated to the things of God to be clear, to be of one mind. It's first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And we'll see how, how relevant those latter two are when we move on into later chapters of James. But here's a question. Why does James use this phrase wisdom from above. I guess it could have been phrased in lots of ways under inspiration. Why this phrase, wisdom from above? Well, come with me please, and here's a suggestion. 
to John chapter 3. It, this was a Jewish problem. John chapter 3. You probably know already uh, where we're going, what I'm going to say. Just consider this for a moment. See, here was Nicodemus, himself highly regarded man, a ruler of the Jews, verse 1 of John 3. And uh, the same came to Jesus by night, verse 2, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born from above. Same word. Nicodemus, you've got to understand. You've got to accept the wisdom from above. You can't carry on the way you are in the traditions that you've received from your fathers and receiving the doctrines of men. You've got to receive what God is saying, that he has sent Jesus Christ from above. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? And we know how the, uh, the conversation uh, carries on. That uh, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the spirit is spirit, spiritual things, the things of God, the things of God's word. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born above, from above. And so we read on. And I believe in this particular context, what is being spoken of here is Nicodemus should hear, listen to the words of Jesus and to John. That was the message from above here. Just listen. That's where the wind was blowing. It's the same word used for voice, this sound in verse 8. Now, come over with me, please. Um, to, well, no, just, just further down in chapter 3 in verse 31. He that cometh, you see, from above, same phrase, is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So this contrast is being made to the Jews particularly. You've got to understand. Think about the wisdom from above that Jesus himself is preaching and teaching to you. There's a difference. Come over please to uh, chapter 8 of John. You see, this didn't go away. It kept bubbling to the surface. Um, verse 20, please, of John 8. These words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, for his hour was not yet come. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, you cannot come. And it's a bit like Nicodemus, isn't it? Jumping to conclusions. Well, yeah. how can you do that? And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. You just don't understand, do you? I am from above. Same phrase. This is the wisdom from above. Exemplified perfectly in Jesus Christ. Showed perfectly in the life of Jesus Christ. Now we're not blundering into any Trinitarian ideas here, brothers and sisters, but we know he was sent by God. He was God's son. Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So the question, brothers and sisters, we now lift the exhortation to ourselves. We're being told here that the difference from being above, thinking of thoughts from above and things on the earth, is whether we are of this world or whether we're not. So that's the difference, isn't it? between the two wisdoms. That's the difference. And we need to think about that, and we shall do. 
Come with me, keep your uh, finger in James, but come with me to a lovely proverb, please. Proverbs 15. And it seems to sum up uh, what's being said here. Proverbs 15 and verse 24. The way of life, of life, is above to the wise. Isn't that a lovely summation of what we've been thinking of? The way of life is above to the wise. So if we are wise, brothers and sisters, if we want to be wise in the things of God, we'll concentrate on things above and not be dragged down by the things of this earth. So let's just think then for a few moments. Let, let's stand aside and think of some very practical issues, brothers and sisters, for ourselves who, who try to follow Jesus Christ and that wisdom that is from above. Where does wisdom take us? Where does man's wisdom take us, brothers and sisters? And, and we need to take this challenge on board and, and think where we stand, don't we? You know, we can see where this world is going, left to man's wisdom. So let's just think about humanism, for one. Humanism. That's having such an impact on this world. The rights, the equality. This is man's wisdom, isn't it? I have my rights. And, and so we read, as you and I know. So we read uh, and, and hear on the news, don't we, brothers and sisters, of legal issues that are raised about people who want to adopt children and can't because they won't condone homosexuality. And so the court ruling is that they can't adopt because you won't say that homosexuality is, ex is acceptable. That's the world we live in. And just in case we think that's too remote still from us, brothers and sisters, I was speaking to a brother and sister only last week, and exactly the same issue has happened now in the Brotherhood, where the court has overruled because they refuse to condone homosexuality. So we are living in a world whose wisdom says that the rights of Sodom are greater than the rights of Salem, Jerusalem. They would rather have people brought up with that sort of mentality than the pureness of the things of God. And it's tragic, isn't it? And this is the environment that our young people are growing up in. They are hearing this at university, at schools, books, the media are all over it, aren't they? And those young people who have got job prospects coming up, what do they have to sign up to? I know again, there have been those that have had to be of good courage and say, I'm sorry, I can't sign that. This code of ethics because of my belief in God, in Jesus Christ, and my understanding of the scriptures, I cannot sign that. And in some cases, have to lose a job. This is the world we're in, brothers and sisters. This is the wisdom from beneath. We need to help each other. We have to be sensitive to those issues and hold fast in these issues, don't we? Come with me, please, to uh, Proverbs 9. You see, I, I suppose the first statement that humanism says is that there is no God. Or was it on the side of the bus, there's probably no God. Same thing. Uh, and that's where they stand, isn't it? Once you've ejected God from your thinking, well, anything goes, doesn't it? There are no restraints. What is truth? Proverbs 9. 
verse 10. Let us take these words to our heart. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, true wisdom, wisdom from above. That's our wisdom. <laughs> the fear of this Lord that does exist, that has created everything, that has given us his word. We can see his handiwork, the beautiful design in creation all around us. If we have eyes to see, of course there's a God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What about another platform of man's wisdom, brothers and sisters? Evolution. They go hand in hand, really, don't they? Hawkins and Dawkins. <laughs> but evolution, that's where man's wisdom takes us. To believe, to honestly believe that, that, that we evolved. And there are those that are far better qualified than me, brothers and sisters, to talk about design in our own bodies and in the creation around. But you know and I know there's clear evidence of design. But you see, sometimes, you know, that, that wisdom of the world can creep into our own community if we're not careful. And we have to watch, watch ourselves, brothers and sisters, you know, theistic evolution. We have to be careful. And, and I, I've heard it on the radio with, with those who profess a belief in the scriptures to accept evolution. And we get this sort of compromise statement, if, if that's the right word. Come with me to Jeremiah, please. Let's see what God's wisdom says about this. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10 and verse 12, please. This is the wisdom from above. He that, this is Jeremiah 10 verse 12, he that made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom. That's how this world is established. That's the wisdom from above, brothers and sisters, not from beneath. And has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. We, we, we can't imagine the power, can we? He said. And, and there were just billions of fish in the oceans. What sort of power is that? What about materialism, brothers and sisters? The world that we live in. This another plank of man's wisdom. You'll be all right. You go up the career ladder. Get as much money as you can. You'll be okay. That's my wisdom. And we've been hearing, haven't we, how, and, and we've been seeing in the last few years how the monetary system is ready for collapse. We need to get hold of this. Just because, sometimes, of the expectations of others around us, we can find ourselves, can't we, being drawn along with this materialistic attitude, brothers and sisters saying, well, I, I suppose I ought to have one of those. And yeah, that, that, that latest mixer does do a, a lovely job, doesn't it? And well, I suppose my PC, my laptop's getting a, a little bit old now. I did buy it last week, so I, I perhaps ought to upgrade, you know. So, um, and uh, as for MP3s, MP4s, I don't know what number it's on now, but, but it's true, isn't it? This, 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 this society, and don't get me wrong, I'm using a laptop as well, okay, so I, I understand that. But we can use them, hopefully, for the glorification of God. But so sadly, technology can be used for evil as well. But we just, brothers and sisters, need to stop and think sometimes. Just stop and think. Is this going to help me towards understanding and manifesting the wisdom of God in my life or not? Is this going to help my brothers and sisters? Because I might be able to afford something or my brother might be able to, but what does this brother or sister over here think? If I have this in my house or pull up in the drive with this or, you know, these sort of things, we need to just respect each other sometimes, perhaps a little bit more and just, just hesitate before we, we leap in sometimes. Come with me please to Ecclesiastes.
You know, Jesus said that our lives do not consist of the things that we possess, brothers and sisters, and we need to understand that. Ecclesiastes 7. Again, comparing the wisdom of man with the wisdom of God. Ecclesiastes 7. Look at verse 12. You see, they're brought together here, but let's just take the difference away. For wisdom is a defence, and money is a defence. Yes, money can help us, absolutely. And we can see it as a defence in certain ways, to protect us from certain things, and yeah. But look at the difference. Look at the difference. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life. Do you remember that was Proverbs 15? Life from above to the wise. That's the difference. Wisdom giveth life. Money cannot give us life, brothers and sisters. It cannot. It cannot. Wisdom can give us life. And we're talking about life in the kingdom now, everlasting life. The things of God, the wisdom from above. That's the difference. <laughs> and the world just doesn't get it. And you can read reports, as I've seen, you know, about those who are incredibly well off, you know, in Hollywood and such like. And they're miserable, locked into their mansions most of the time. Wisdom, my dear brothers and sisters, from the things of God, from the things of his word. Let's, let's treasure this word as we ought, the faith. Let's not treat it casually. Let's not treat the promises casually. As our brother Kitson has reminded us again. Let's love them and live them. <coughs> and one other final aspect just to briefly consider in terms of the wisdom of this world and that is concerning the Bible itself, the Word of God. Of course it's ridiculed even in this the 400th year as it celebrates um, so-called the translation of the 1611. The Bible by and large as you and I know is ridiculed at our workplaces, with our neighbours. It's a book of fables. <coughs> How do we regard the scriptures, brothers and sisters? Are we starting to lose traction in our reading, in our keeping going and meditating upon it daily with our families, with other members of our ecclesia, perhaps? And again, we need to think, don't we, about the Bibles that we, that we do use. What about the translation that we decide to choose, brothers and sisters? Is it as accurate as we can get to the wise words of God in the original, in the Hebrew and the Greek? Or does it just not matter to us? And so, you know, any, any version will do. We need to consider these things. We, we mustn't take knee-jerk reactions uh, and, and, and jump in to something that we might regret. And, and our young people in their youth groups, brothers and sisters, is it right to say, well, I think um, they ought to use this version now, when perhaps there's no study aids to help them in that? So these are food, this is food uh, for thought. And we know, don't we, 2 Timothy and uh, chapter 3, um, that these words are they will make us wise unto salvation. Well, we must press on. One aspect of wisdom, come back to uh, James chapter 1, please. One aspect that um, James wants to particularly draw out as an example where a special wisdom is needed is in the case of trial and temptation. Um, so verse 1 of James, uh, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall 
into diverse temptations. The word count there uh, means to lead to or to rule over the overarching principle there. Elsewhere, we know that it's, it's not a joyous thing to fall into to trial. It's not. But the word count in the Greek means that it should help us look forward to the joy. It's the same principle stated in Hebrews 12 and verse 1, where Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured uh, the suffering. So this word count it all joy, the, the end of it is that it leads us to God willing in God's mercy to joy when we fall into diverse temptations. And there's a key word in verse three, brothers and sisters, when it comes to temptations and trials. And it's the word knowing. And this is where knowledge comes in, you see. That for us who have put our lives in the hands of God and committed our ways to God, we have a knowledge that other people walking down the streets and our neighbours do not have. We have a knowledge, knowing, verse 3, that God is working with us. That's the difference. We have a knowledge that even in trial and difficulties and tragedies that we come across in our lives, we have a knowledge that God is working with us and therefore it's a comfort to us that people in the world know nothing of. Now, I just would like to show you this, this slide and I don't want to, the last thing I want to do is make the issues of trial and difficulty an academic thing. Um, but this might just help us understand some of the words that are used here. So most of the words come from the, the particular root, which means to try, test or tempt. And it can mean to try or to tempt. But it depends which perspective we're coming from. If we view those things that happen to us in a negative way, brothers and sisters, then we can, we can call it a, a temptation. And that's what James goes on to reason. We'll just have brief time to look at that. But if we look at it from God's perspective, the things that happen, hopefully we will see it as a trial that matures us and develops us towards God's wisdom. And so in James 1, let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And so here, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men. Now, I don't believe that that means um, when a trial comes uh, upon us that we, that we pray and ask God for wisdom and that we're instantly uh, given wisdom just like that. It doesn't work like that. In fact, that would negate exactly what James is saying because it's all about patience and that wouldn't exercise patience at all if we were suddenly given wisdom to understand everything that's going on. Uh, and we don't know sometimes why things come upon us. We don't know, brothers and sisters. But as a community, as brothers and sisters, we need to help each other when difficulties do come upon any of us. Because trial can make us go one of two ways, essentially. It can, if we are exercised thereby, draw us nearer to God in faith or cause us to go further away from God. Now, my time's pretty much up, but I've just got to show you this last slide. <laughs> it won't take long, I promise. Because for me, this, this resolves, and I believe there is a, a helpful resolution here in this chapter. Just look at verse 13, please, brothers and sisters, of, of chapter 1. Let no man say when he is tempted, you see, I am tempted of God. Let's not do that. God doesn't tempt. He tries, but he doesn't tempt for our benefit. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Now look at this. I'm going to show you that 
there is a wonderful parallel in this chapter. It's a he Hebrew poetry, really, a wonderful parallel that helps us get things in context. The contrast in verse 17, no, every perfect gift comes from God and it's from above. <laughs> it's exactly what we're thinking about. Good things come from above, brothers and sisters. You see, we are the ones that are drawn away by our own lust. But God never changes. How comforting is that? And throughout generations, God never changes. Never. We're the ones who change. So let's put our trust in God. Let's pray to him. It's our own lust. It's God's own will that he wants to help us. It's our own lust that's the problem. When we bring ourselves into difficulties. But it's God's will. He wants to help us if we will commit our ways to him. And this really clinched it for me, brothers and sisters. Verse 15, that there's this Greek word only occurs twice in the whole of the New Testament. And here they are in this parallel. One bringeth forth sin if we are left to ourselves. God just wants to begat us. To have a rebirth in the things and the wisdom from above. That's what God is interested for. Let us look to him. You see where man takes us, man's wisdom? It brings forth death. That's where it ends. But God, the things of God, is just the beginning. The first fruit. The first fruit. Where does that take us? 1 Corinthians 15? Resurrection, the things of life. How wonderful is that? So don't err, brothers and sisters. Let's, let's always view God as someone that we must and can place our trust in. In all of our lives, at all times, let's be swift to hear. And so they both end on the lovely note of James calling his readers beloved brethren, his Jewish brothers and sisters, beloved brethren, put your trust in God.